Uh, thank you so much for being here. What a joy it is to see a full house. We do have a seat available here. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that's great. And if we have any latecomers, we'll try to grab a few more chairs. How awesome is this? We are celebrating our alumni this week. My name is Lynn Vartan, and as many of you know, I'm the director of Apex Events. And this is our second, and I hope to be always annual, alumni collaboration. Uh, we are so excited here to be able to feature as a speaker with Apex Events our outstanding alumnus. Before I tell you a little bit about him, I just want to skip into next week because uh, for those of you who are in the class and will be attending the event next week, I just want to make sure everybody knows that there's a lot of extra security for next week's event, which is our live appeals court cases that are being heard on campus. So there is extra screening, your bags will be searched, there's a full search going into the building. So just be aware of that in terms of your timing. Try to arrive a little bit early as possible because it can get a little bit bottlenecked right at 11.30, so be aware of that. But that's next week. Today we are celebrating our alumni. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Mvemba Dizolele is a writer, foreign policy analyst, and independent journalist. He's a professional lecturer in African studies at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Study Studies. Formerly, he was a distinguished visiting fellow and a national fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Um, he has a forthcoming book coming out, um, um, uh, Mobutu, The Rise and Fall of the Leper King by Random House. His analyses have been published in the Journal of Democracy, the New York Times, Newsweek International, International Herald Tribune, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, News Republic, Forbes, uh, and other outlets. He's a frequent commentator on Afri African affairs and has been a guest analyst on PBS's NewsHour and Foreign Exchange, NPR's Tell Me More, on Point, uh, BBC World News Update, and Al Jazeera's The Stream and Inside Story. He has testified before various subcommittees of both chambers of the U.S. Congress, as well as before the U.N. Security Council. Council. He was granted uh, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and covered the 2006 elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He has an international MBA and MPP from the University of Chicago. And as we know, he graduated magnum cum laude with a BA in political science and French from SUU. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our outstanding alumnus, Mbeba Dizolele. Thank you very kindly, Lynn. Uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, truly an honor. I studied my, uh, you know, everything I need to know, I actually learned in kindergarten. For the rest, I learned at SUU. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's always a homecoming when I'm back here. And it's particularly a pleasure to be able to share a little bit with you some of my thinking, some of the stuff that uh, I've done. And, um, but before I do, I'd like to thank a few people here, uh, the Convocation Apex uh, team that uh, invited me. But I want to talk uh, to thank Mindy Benson that has seen the audience. I remember receiving a text saying, we'd like to invite you and honor you. And my first sense was like, I think the level of education has gone down <laughs> if you're inviting me. But it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Ron Carden has really been uh, the work and the force behind the logistics of being here. I see my former advisor, Dr. Michael Statis. I see my family, the Burgoynes. I see friends, Georgia Beth Thompson, and many of you that I can, Stuart Jones, who has been on my back forever. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to speaking to uh, many of you. So today, I want to take you, to invite you on a journey, challenge a little bit of uh, our thinking. If you may join me on a journey to come to Congo, yeah, that's just south of Panguitch. Uh, <laughs> and the DR Congo is very important for a set of reasons. And today, what I'm, I'm going to argue is stuff that you may already know and stuff that may, you may not know that I'll push you on. He's to say that Congo has been at the center of all major revolutions. And you say, what kind of revolution is talking about? I'm not talking about, let's burn down this place kind of revolution. What I'm talking about is a couple issues that I'd like to, to address, is that countries, like human beings, have DNA. 
You know, it depends on where you were born, where you were born, what your makeup is. In the case of country, it depends on your history, and so on and so forth. So we're going to go to DRC, uh, which is it's called today, but it was not always called that. And then the other element that I also want to address is that um, size does matter. Uh, this is part of your DNA. Just because your DNA is, they say you are, you're most likely to develop heart disease doesn't mean you're going to develop heart disease. Yeah. Countries have similar issues. Just because you don't have resources doesn't mean you have to be poor. Just because you have a lot of resources doesn't mean you're going to be rich. Uh, so it's those kind of issues that I want to address today. And the DRC is one of those countries that sits at that intersection. So come with me to 1482. 1482, a young naval commander from Portugal by the name of Diego Cao is going around the world. And why are Europeans going around the world? Because their food is pretty bland. Right? <laughs> so if you live in England, you're like, this food I can't have. Yes, you can have it. It's your own food. It's called porridge. No, I need some curry. You have you any curry? Like, no, you don't have curry here. You have to go down the river, down the ocean, go down to Congo, go to India. And there they find pepper and cumin. And my pudding tastes better now with cumin. Yes, you have curry. Now we have pili pili. So this guy, Diego Cao, naval commander from Portugal, stumbled onto the east estuary of the Congo River. He didn't know what it was, but he said he discovered it, which we find problematic because, like, no, you did not cover, discover anything here. This river has been here. It's our river, <laughs> right? And of course, he wanted to claim it in the name of his king in Portugal. Said, no, you cannot claim this either. It's our country. So he stumbled right here, the estuary of the Congo River. The Congo River is the second most powerful river in the world after the Amazon. And both the Congo River and the Amazon straddle the equator. So the most powerful because the level of rainfall remains the same throughout the year. And this is a serious, uh, a serious advantage for the Congo River, for electric, uh, electro electric energy and many other issues, agriculture. When you live in a place like Congo, you don't, you're typically not out of food because your crops, when it's dry season in the north, it's rain season in the south. So the crop that you have in the north for six months, when they're out of season, you grow them in the south. So anyway, the young fellow, the young commander step, uh, stumbled on the Congo River, want to give it a name. He gave it his name. He didn't know the name. We told him, but he decided he named it anyway. So Portugal at the time is one of the superpowers along with Spain. It's kind of hard to think about Portugal as a superpower today. When you visit Lisbon, it's not particularly, it doesn't reek of any power. But at one point, this were the superpowers of the world. So quickly, and this is where the DNA comes in, the Portuguese decide it's going to be the holdings. Yeah. And Spain is also the other superpower. And Spain is agitating. So are the French and others. They want a peace to this. So the Portuguese decide they need to have a conference. They can discuss the future of what they call the Congo Basin. Now, I'm saying Congo size, size matter. Congo is the size of Western Europe. In other words, it's four times the size of France. It's one third the size of the United States. The United States east of the Mississippi, from Vermont all the way to Florida. So it's a huge country. It's the only African country with two time zones. And that's, how, that's how big it is. Um, it is the second largest country in Africa in terms of land mass. It is the, most, the fourth most populated country in Africa. So a lot of issues. So, the Portuguese, because they discovered, quote unquote, Kedi Ukao discovered this, they want to claim the entire Congo basin. So I said Congo was bigger, uh, it was the size of uh, Western Europe, four times bigger than France. The Congo basin is even bigger than because the Congo basin extends all the way into Angola. All these rivers are part of the Congo basin and go around there. They couldn't agree, so they had this conference. What would came to be known as the Berlin Conference. But the original name of the Berlin Conference is actually the Congo Conference, because they were trying to settle this. And as they struggled to settle, this was 1885, 
um, they eventually start to, let's go back to 1482. So 1482 is the first wave of what I call the first revolution. By revolution, I mean a series of events that changed the course of history of the world. So this spice thing, looking for pili pili and coming and curry to spice your porridge down in Scotland, led to this, this race here. And eventually, the relationships start developing between the various kingdoms along the coasts. So you can see more of the basin here, much more clear. So various kingdoms along the Guinea, the coast of Guinea, here start developing relationship with Europe. So the transformation of diet and food and taste. And then quickly, the science itself starts progressing. And then quickly, unfortunately, there's also along the other side, an Italian guy got lost on his way to India and claimed that he landed in a place called America, yeah, Jamaica. Uh, those guys, he named the place, right? Again, he's like, well, I discovered this place. No, he didn't cover it. We've been here. <laughs> so he, with the change of the discovery, quote unquote, we needed labor. And as part of that labor, where did we find a lot of that labor? We well, find a lot of that labor, free labor, so to speak, in Africa. So Congo, on the coast here, became one of the regions where a lot of the Africans who came to the New World came from. So in the case of the US alone, Sullivan Island, which is in South Carolina, which is considered the earliest island of African Americans. This is where the port of entry with for pretty much every blacks who came from, Amer from Africa to America went through. About 25% of them came from Congo. So just to give you a sense of the contribution of Congo to that first wave of the first revolution, which I call the Spice Revolution. Okay. So 25% of African Americans came from the Congo region. If you've been to New Orleans, then you've probably heard of Congo Square. Congo Square is part of where the market, the slave market was. It was also the place where people used to, the slaves used to go for a break to play the drums and others. Speaking of drum, you've heard of Cong conga drums. Conga drums are Congo drums. Right? And so if Congo Square in New Orleans, just to give you an example of where place Congo had an influence, and then you have the way they bury people in New Orleans, all that music. That's actually Congo culture. I just so happen to be Congo ethnically, Congo with a K. So that's actually the way. So that's just to give you an example of the influence here. And then jazz, blues, and music, you can trace that experience. If you go to the islands, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, uh, Haiti, the incidence of Congo population is much higher. Right? So in fact, if you go to Colombia and places like Palenque, you still find communities that speak a Congo dialect. It's a mix of Congo and, and uh, Spanish, which they call palenquero. Right. So that was the first wave, the Spice Revolution, where Congo played a major role. The next wave of revolution that we have is what I call the Industrial Revolution. Right? And the Industrial Revolution, we know what it is. The Industrial Revolution is driven by coal, but is also driven by something else, which is tire. Goodyear, think Dunlop, think Firestone. And tire comes from rubber. And one of the places where the bulk of the rubber was coming from is Congo. This is under King Leopold. So we've read about King Leopold's ghost. We've read The Heart of Darkness. And we've watched Apocalypse Now. Right? All those are traced that. So between 1885, when Congo became the Congo Free State, to 1908, the Industrial Revolution is really picking up. And the drive and the demand for rubber make it so that King Leopold becomes the most violent person that the world has known. During those years, those 15 years, 15 to 20 years, about 15 to 20 million Congolese perished because the Leopoldian regime was driven by the demand of rubber for the Industrial Revolution, which meant if your village did not produce enough rubber, King Leopold's troops would come and chop off your limbs burn your village, rape your women, and the consequence was that people were no longer eating, you couldn't treat them, 15 to 18 million, 15 to 20 million people perished. So it's kind of like the first Holocaust in a long time. In fact, it was also the time when the term crimes against humanity was coined. So think about this industrial revolution and the role Congo play in it. The revolution could have happened in other words, in other ways as well, I'm sure there were a few other, but the incident of the contribution out of Congo, both in terms of the resource itself 
and the cost to human, humanity, to the human resources, was extremely high. So then we have the next set of revolution, and that will be what I call, let's destroy this world revolution. Yeah, that were the two World War II. Right? We want to destroy ourselves in the name of nationality, in the name of nationalism, in the name of all kinds of things. But during those, two, this, in those war periods, we always think of the war as a European business. Europeans like to kill each other. Yeah? It's in the DNA. No, just kidding. <laughs> but there's a track record of this thing. So as the wars were taking place in Europe, we always think about it that way. Um, but the reality is, because Europeans have holdings here, the conflict here, both in World War I and World War II, trickled down here. Right? So in World War I, the uh, German control this area here, Rwanda, Burundi, and Tanganyika. They control what is known as Namibia today. They control Togo, and they control part of Cameroon. They actually control the entire region. So to vanquish the Germans, colonial power need to use African forces. So in the case of Tanzania here and Rwanda and Burundi, this, some serious battle took place here. It took place here from the Congolese army vanquishing the German. Yeah. So again, we don't think of the African being part of that. They were very much part of that. For it to World War II, Mussolini had grandiose dreams and he occupied Ethiopia. So for a long time, he had his Italy wanted to be a superpower like everybody else. So the Battle of Sasayo, Asosa, and the Battle of Gambela, which took place in the spring of 41, where Italian troops were vanquished and were kicked out of Ethiopia, those battles were fought by Congolese troops. In fact, in 41, nine Italian generals with their troops, which outnumbered the Congolese one to three, surrendered to Congolese troops. Now, history will say they surrendered to the Belgians, right? Because the Belgians were the officers. The fighters were Congolese. So a handful of officers will not have anguished the Italians. So this is very important. This is a big, big contribution doing this let's destroy ourselves uh, revolution. The other important part, we think of the Manhattan Project. We think about the bombs that the Enola Gay dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Little man and fat boy. The Manhattan Project will have probably succeeded either way with scientists like Enrico Fermi and others. But they need a specific type of uranium. That uranium was only found in Congo. So little man and fat boy are Congolese. We dropped them on Hiroshima. Without Congo, this would not have been possible at that time, not at that speed. Today, Congo has a nuclear reactor, the only reactor you find in Africa, the only nuclear reactor. It doesn't work very well, but it's still a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and that nuclear reactor was a gift from the US to Congo because of his contribution to the victory in World War II. It was part of what they call peace for atoms. I mean, atoms for peace under Dwight Eisenhower. So this gives you just a couple, three revolutions we've gone through where a country like Congo, which we don't think about as playing this major role. But it's to tell that the world is much more interconnected than we typically think. So this part of this DNA itself then becomes an issue when Congo becomes independent. Right? So this is where we get to the birth of a nation. This is where the DNA still plays a role. Because Congo had been a private property of King Leopold, Congo did not build a lot of national identity. It was an, a, a colony of exploitation. It was, oh, let's get as much as we can get out of this place. So in 1960, as the country is going to independence, quickly they have to build a nation, which is not easy. We saw how big the place is. Right? The place is very big. So people were living over here, did not have a lot of interaction with people living over here. All of a sudden, independence, you have to become one nation. So then you have to decide, what do we do? Do we become a country with a strong centralized power, or do we become a country with a kind of decentralized federal stuff? Doing this here, this is after, is an extension of let's destroy our world revolution, right? the Cold War and others. So the issues of governance become very prominent. And then you have two characters, two personalities, very strong, who are the fathers of independence with Patrice Lumumba here on the left, who believes in a strong central government. Yeah. And then you have Joseph Kasavubu, who believes in a federated type of system. And this is the friction that the Congo starts with at birth. So within 11 days of independence,
the country gets into secession. There's a war of secession. Uh, the rich province in the south, which is the rich province with uh, all the mining at the time, seceded, again, with European support, because European wanted to build uh, kind of a, um, a union here where they would take, you know, Cecil Rhodes and those guys, Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and this part to be the power half of all, all resources. So in this interim time, uh, it's also time where the U.S. is getting engaged in places like Vietnam and others. And it's also the time of what I call the sound barrier revolution. You know, and it is time for you to build your jet flying fast, and uh, you need a set of resources, cobalt, tungsten, and others. Where do you find those? You find them in Congo. So Congo becomes a very important piece of real estate where nobody wants to let go. The Chinese want a piece of it. The American want a piece of it. The Russian want a piece of it. So this becomes a place where all the forces meet. And during this revolution, secession takes place. The UN deploys its largest peacekeeping mission ever at that time. In fact, the head of the UN at the time, Dagmar Schuld, a German, died in a plane crash trying to resolve the issue. If you go to New York, the UN Plaza is called the Dagama Jod Plaza at the UN, it's because the guy died in DRC. So during this time, we are also dealing with, you know, is an SOB, is our SOB, you know, Cold Warrior, we need Cold Warrior. So Congo gets his Cold Warrior, a fellow by the name of Mobutu Seseko. You know, he's a military guy, the CIA will support him at any cost. And the fellow to the right here is John Paul II, who's Polish who believes that capitalism in the best way, freedom. So he really lined with the dictator against the Catholic Church, because the local church is fighting dictatorship. But the Pope sees the world in black and white. And Mobutu is our guy. He fights communism. The Pope had an experience, bad experience with communism in Poland. So he support the Cold Warrior. So this fellow will stay in power for 32 years. Right? Mobutu stays in power for 32 years. As Mobutu is collapsing, this is the Pope visiting Congo. As Mobutu is collapsing, we go to the other set of the next type, the next revolution. The next revolution is what, what I call the digital revolution. All of you here have cell phones, you have your laptops. That, that stuff was made possible through resources that you find mostly in Congo. And those resources are tungsten, coltan, com columbine, and columbite, and others. So, and this also came at a high cost for the Congolese. A war broke out after Mobutu died, and uh, the entire country has been in conflict since then. So you read a lot about sexual, vi sexual violence in the East, militia and others, all that we can trace that. So our revolution today with our digital revolution, we're actually doing that on the back of the Congolese in many ways. And Congo is very present in your life in a way that you probably didn't think about. So, at the same time as this is collapsing, we have the genocide in Rwanda, and that spills over the DRC because of refugees. Refugees are very apropos today. We talk about how many Syrian US should take and all that stuff. Congo took about 2 million Rwandans. Now, we opt often talk about our borders in the US. We have two neighbors in the north, Canada, in the south, Mexico. That's it. Congo has nine neighbors. It's one of the few countries, there are only a handful of countries. I don't think there are more than five countries that have that many neighbors. Nine neighbors, so try to manage your borders with nine neighbors, right? Uh, so the Rwandan doing the genocide, after the genocide, two millions of them spill into Congo. And of course, when you have refugees spilling into your country, they bring, they typically flee conflict, but they also bring conflict to your country, not because they want to, but the very presence causes friction. They're hungry, they go to your field, and they eat your fruit. You're not going to like them. They want to do fire, make fire for the tent, they go cut in your orchard. And then they're being fed by the UN, and your people are starving, and you just don't see any end to this. And eventually, this same, uh, in the case of Rwanda, the entire Rwandan army that had been vanquished had relocated to DRC in refugee camps with the entire arsenal. The entire central bank of Rwanda relocated in DRC across the border with all the reserves. And they started recruiting people and so on. And eventually, uh, Rwanda invaded the part of Congo and we caused the conflict that we know today. So, you know, 
Mobutu get left, liberation happens, but every time you hear somebody says they've come to liberate you, you should be worried. Right? Because if anybody who comes to liberate you, that means they've come really to subjugate you. Uh, they, will try, they will think the world starts with them and your freedom depends on them. And we know the result of that. So whereas a country like DRC, I said size matter, it was important because with size, uh, you have less problem in terms of ethnicity. If you are the size of DRC, it's, very, it's impo impossible for one community, one ethnic group to dominate anyone. Right? That's, it's not, just not possible. We have a lot of ethnic groups, but you cannot, a group here cannot dominate people here. They don't even live where you guys live, so there's no connection. If you are Rwanda, you're very small, then you get in this fight, who dominates whom? Right? Conflict becomes inevitable. So the next wave of, uh, this is the guy who replaced Mobutu, Laurent Desiree Kabila. This is the guy supposed to be the liberator. Yeah, it's uh, subjugating people. So when you have this kind of wars and situation, then you have start feeling, you start dealing with another issue, which is the state collapse itself. How do you rebuild the state? But if you took your power through war, you cannot be the liberator that brings democracy to the country. So you start only dealing with what serves you and not the rest. So you start having issue with peace. You cannot build your um, institutions. State itself becomes a source of insecurity because the state is reducing people's liberties and people are rebelling against the state. So it becomes a source of social contract collapses under these circumstances. And then you have this world body called the ICC, which think they can bring justice to places, but it's always, it typically doesn't work, doesn't serve the community they're trying to serve. And the result is you privatize and criminalize the public space. And by that I mean it's not just you have the creation of militias and others, but you also have people, civil servants, who go on to their, their own things they want to do. Uh, I give you an example. One time I was in Kinshasa, and I got tired of being driven by a chauffeur. You know, typically you go in this thing. I said, I would like to drive. It'd be nice to drive. So I asked a friend, I said, I need a driver's license. Do we go to the DMV? Do we? He says, no, no, don't worry about it. I can get you a driver's license. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, we need about 100 bucks, two pictures. I can get you a driver's license. So I've never left the room. And two days later, we got a driver's license. Uh, it was a real driver's license. It was not a counterfeit. It came from the DMV. It the money just didn't go to the national treasurer. Yeah, it's expired since then, but I still have it as <laughs> archives. You know? So you start having this thing where state cannot even generate income to survive. But meanwhile, you have the UN over there. The entire UN is over there. The, second, the, the, most, the largest UN mission is in Congo. For those of you who serve in the military, these are military units, right? But you can see the names of the country. India, it's a unit from India, a unit from Uruguay, Malawi, South Africa, uh, Pakistan, China, China, Benin, Pakistan, Belgium, Senegal. But you wonder, if everybody's in Congo, why is there still conflict? Uh, you start wondering, there's something is wrong. The budget of the UN in Congo is $1.3 billion a year. The United States pays 27% of it. And women are still being raped. Democracy has not come. And the UN doesn't have, see any end in sight. Yeah? So here, the traditional that DNA is talking about, Congo being created as the global trading outpost at the Berlin Conference, the Congo Conference 18, that mentality, that wave has not changed. Right? So the country is almost held hostage on one level by the international community. On one level, because of the, all the revolutions I've mentioned, resources that we need, we don't care so much if it works or not, because we just need to have access to the resources. So this is a banded solution. So this actually, when I was embedded with UN peacekeepers in Bunia, we're going on patrol in, in one of the area there in the north, uh, northeast part. These are Moroccan troops, American-made vehicles, yeah. and American money in between to support them. Uh, they were playing police role. Uh, that's the flag of Morocco there. But these are stuff that the Congolese should be doing themselves. We should help them rebuild the army, not doing this stuff in their place, because it doesn't make any sense. These guys here, the Moroccan, don't speak the language, so they cannot get a lot of the subtleties that's happening in the country anyway. Um, this was at the front line. Troops were staging for something. 
yours truly was hanging out with Moroccan officers. They're giving me a briefing about what's happening and challenging them in being nice. You have to smile for them. They're protecting you. Right? This is when we're doing patrol on the lake, trying to accept weapons coming from Uganda, which were supporting some of the militias to DRC. So we're trying to intercept the various barges and stuff. On, but these guys were Uruguayan. They were very under-equipped. They didn't have a lot of weapons. They didn't have anything. I remember being in the middle of the, the lake one evening as we were approaching a, a barge. And there was one night vision goggle unit. So one is using it. The other one is. And I'm like, if these people open fire on us, we are toast. There was no rescue that would be coming. There is no helicopter. There is no ra rapid force. So you just pray that everything will be fine. Um, that's us doing our patrol on the lake. That's them. Everybody needs a friend. That's them. This is the new pres the president who's in power now. Uh, the fellow is not delivered for the country, but he loves power, so he doesn't want to leave. Yeah. He has not been able to build that strong sense of national identity that exists over the years because he's not delivering on governance. You know, so people now are retreating into regionalism in terms of surviving across the country. Yeah. You have sexual violence all over the place. Last week, a Congolese doctor won the Nobel Prize for Peace because he's become an expert in resolving the issue of sexual violence. In other words, reconstructive surgery on women who've been violated. That's not a great feeling. You know, he's an OBGYN. He was trained to deliver babies and deal with other issues. But he's made a name as they, they call him the fixer of women. Yeah. And we need to stop that. So is the United part of the problem with the solution? You can answer that question. Right. Um, what is saving places like the DRC is a strong civil society. And then we have to start thinking about the alternate alternative to the UN. I don't think the UN deliver in this front. The UN deliver in many other ways. UNICEF is a wonderful institution. They help children. FAO is a great institution. Peacekeeping for the UN is not a great program for the UN. You just, nobody goes die and to die for somebody else. It doesn't make any sense. Congolese are fully capable. We should allow them to defend themselves and rebuild the country. So this leads us to the next revolution, which is happening soon. And you're part of it, what I call the Elon Musk revolution. <laughs> right? And that is your batteries, your car is running on battery. You drive a Tesla that speaks to you. you know? um, but that is not possible without one key ingredient called cobalt. And Congo is the largest producer of cobalt. So here again, Congo is knocking on your door. Right? So the next river, so I don't mean to say that Congo is the best country in the world, but in this case, there's an argument to be made for it because very few countries have played that role to be at the center of all this revolution that's affecting our lives positively. So issue, election happened. So these are the guys that we call the Congolese army. I was able to sweet talk them to posing for me. Yeah, I, the skills I learned at SUU, student government. Yeah. As caressing is a weapon out there. But you know, people always ask me, how do I define security or insecurity? I always say insecurity is the gut feeling you get when you see people in uniform and armed. When you see people in uniform and armed and you want to say hello to them, then you're probably in a secure environment. But if you see character like this, do you want to go talk to them? I had to talk to them because it's part of my job. But most people are not going to talk to them, right? Because you don't know what's going to come out of that. Uh, this is the police. Yeah. Often you don't trust them, but I talk to them. They pose for me. This was during the elections. It's a vote, Bureau of Vote. Women voting. It's a, Congo is a relatively young country. I think 50% of the population under 17 years old. And then more than half the population are women. So the future of Congo is right there. These are pygmies. I was observing the election. This was in the rainforest. We had to ensure that the pygmies were voting. Pygmies are very short. It's, it's not a derogatory term, but that's what we call them. This is the mines I'm talking about, the rare earth minerals, the coal tan and stuff. These are, these are just kids. I had gone to do a report, and this is what I found. Right? So they're not in school. The, your coal tan, your cell phone, this is where it's coming from. This is, again, tungsten. This is the condition people are working on in stuff. But a lot of money. This stuff here, 
at the height of the war, a pound of this cost about $400. So we're talking about Wakanda. We're talking about avatars. And we're talking everything in one, Game of Thrones and all that stuff. This is the same. So you can see the condition. Imagine working day in and day out in this dust. These guys have invited me to come to the tunnels when we were filming. I say, no, I do the story. I'm not the story. Because uh, this stuff collapses a lot, and they die. So I was talking about this revolution. One area where Congo is also very important is its rainforest. We're talking about the ice cap melting. Canada won't be able to save the ice cap. Utah, for sure not. The desert won't do it. Right? There's only so much we can do in the desert. The rainforest is where the future of the ozone layer lies. And Congo is the second lung of the world after the Amazon. This is a botanical garden in the rainforest. And this is not the Congo River. So Congo, because of what I was talking earlier about the Congo Basin, is also home to 50% of the hydroelectric power potential of Africa. These are two main dams, Inga Dam and uh, Inga 1, Inga 2. By the way, Morrison Knudsen, for those of you from Idaho, was very involved in the transmission lines of this. Yeah. One was built in 1968, the other one in 1968 to 72, the other one in 19, completed in 82. There's supposed to be a third Inga, and there's supposed to be a bigger Inga called the Grand Inga that will cost about $80 billion to develop. After this stuff is developed, so these are the two Ingas. So if they manage to develop them, then the DRC Congo will sell power all the way to Saudi Arabia, all the way to Spain, all the way to South Africa. So Congo can light all of, all of Africa and part of Europe and part of Asia. So that's what we talk in terms of resources. This is the dam, part of the dam. So I just want to bring your attention to see how big these turbines are. These are stairs leading up to the chambers. So you can see how big they are to give you a sense of, uh, of proportion. Yeah, it is this. This, this turbines here. Yeah. So that's the country now, the reconstruct the reconfiguration. We're going back to that debate. Should it have a strong central government or should it be federated? So they've started decentralizing the country, and that's where Congo is today. So with that in mind, I think I've provoked you enough. We can come back to see the city now, you know, back to 2018. Thank you very much for your attention.